Hi! In this video I am going to talk about the hardware architecture of my minimalistic breadboard computer. So be prepared for some technical diagrams here. I'll focus on the general picture though. I'll explain the relevant design decisions and avoid detailed schematics. Let us warm up with a game of Tetris running on the hardware we are going to explore, just to see where this is all heading. I think my little adaptation of this all-time classic shows that we can have some real fun with this CPU. So let's take a deep breath and dive in. You might think that at first sight all this stuff looks anything but minimalistic. Well, keep in mind that it's a prototype and that it doesn't have any ready-made CPU, but is built from scratch using standard 74xx logic ICs. Let's freeze the picture and take a closer look. The whole board can be considered having two separate parts. The computer itself and its VGA terminal module. In this video we'll focus on the computer. The design uses a classic von Neumann architecture having a single 8-bit bus connecting its functional blocks. Let's start with two registers, A and B, which simply read and write 8 bits of data to the bus. Each register is controlled by two signals, A in and A out, and B in and B out respectively. And by the way, if you feel that while following along you need more information on how these building blocks of a CPU work in general, I again highly recommend to check out the channel by Ben Eater first. I'll include the link to Ben's channel in the description. Now let's connect an adder circuit. It takes in the values A and B as arguments for addition. Our adder has an output control signal EO or sometimes sigma O for sum out. And it has a separate carry in signal EC which will prove very useful later. A third signal ES conditionally inverts B prior to adding it to A. This allows to perform subtractions, since in 2's complement a subtraction of B is equivalent to simply adding the inverse of B plus 1. Our adder module also outputs three flags, indicating a negative carry out and a zero condition in the result. Now let's add some RAM. RAM IO is controlled by the signals RAM IN and RAM OUT. And we need a way to specify which memory address we want to operate on. This location is stored in the so-called memory address register or MAR. It is built like a 16-bit register holding the most significant byte and the least significant byte of our memory address. Additionally, it can increment itself by one step, making it easy to access consecutive memory locations. So we need the control signals memory in high, memory in low, and memory count enable, or short ME, here. So far so good, but where do all these control signals come from? Who is controlling them? That brings us to the control logic of our CPU. Its heart is an EEPROM outputting all these control lines. For every address we select at the EEPROM's input, it outputs a corresponding set of control signals. But still, we need something that selects the EEPROM's input address. This address is determined by three little registers. 6 bits 
come from the so-called instruction register IR. Holding the opcode of the instruction, our CPU is currently executing. Then there is a 4-bit resettable instruction step counter and a 3-bit flex register holding the state of the negative carry out and zero flex. Bundled together, these registers form the 13-bit address input of the EEPROM. It is quite obvious where the flex register and the step counter get their data from. But what about the instruction register? Well, we simply read instructions in as a sequence of bytes programmed into memory. To keep track where we currently are in our program, we need another register, the program counter. Like the memory address register, it consists of two cascaded 8-bit counters, forming a 16-bit register with control signals counter high in, counter high out, counter low in, and counter low out. Like the memory address register, the program counter also has a control signal count enable, or CE, incrementing its stored value by one. Now we are almost done. We need just another two registers in order to be able to exchange data with a terminal. One for terminal input, or short TI, and one for terminal output, TO. Data we write to terminal in will appear on our terminal display, and when we press a key, the terminal out register holds the corresponding key code. So, time to count up our control signals. We arrive at 22. We'd need at least three 8-bit EEPROMs for that many signals. Things are getting big and a bit awkward, since we would run out of space in our little breadboard and it would be a lot of work to wire everything up. Let's try to minimize. As a first step, let's bundle the control signals CE and ME together, so that we simultaneously increment the program counter and the memory address register. That's no big deal. Second, let's use the EO control signal to trigger the read-in of the flex and thus getting rid of the FI control signal or flex-in control signal. We've already made it down to only 20 signals. Four more to go. Let's get rid of TI and TO next by replacing them with some simple logic. As you can see, we have only 32 kilobytes of RAM, starting from hex address 0000 up to 7FFF. That's 14 bits. Bit 15 of the memory address register is sort of unused. Let's use it to switch off the RAM and feed RAM in and RAM out through to terminal in and terminal out in case it's active. To access our terminal registers, we would then simply have to write or read to address 8000 or higher. In that way, we have mapped our I.O. ports to a memory address range. Just like so. The logic could be implemented by a single inverter and two OR gates since both signals are active low. Okay, we've saved another two control lines here. Let's squeeze out two more. Here comes the idea. Note that we have six control signals controlling the data flow of the 16-bit registers. That's counter in low, counter in high, counter out low, counter out high, memory in low and memory in high. What if we replace these six signals by only three signals? Counter in, counter out 
and memory in together with a single control line to select whether we operate on the most significant byte or least significant byte. Let's call this signal high. Again, we could come up with simple logic to implement this feature. Like so. And yeah, we've made it down to 16 control lines. And this architecture is exactly what I have implemented on my prototyping board. Now, one could be tempted to further improve things by implementing CPU pipelining or by adding more registers. But remember, this project is about minimalism, not just performance. Let us identify the modules now on the real hardware. Up on the right you can see the program counter and below the two registers A and B feeding their values to the adder circuit. On the left below our VGA terminal module we have our RAM and the memory address register. Down here you can see the control logic. We have the 16-bit EEPROM, the step counter, our instruction register and the flags register. Some peripheral functions are provided by an Arduino Nano here in the center. You might say that's all but minimalistic and you are right. But in a way it still is since it minimizes build time. It's all one big best compromise. This Arduino provides a clean system clock and reads out the PS2 keyboard that saves us tens of toggle switches. Finally, here is an overview of all the ICs I've used on this board. So this is it for today. Thank you very much for following along. I hope I could show that this design actually is quite straightforward and uses its part efficiently. The real magic, however, is hidden in the microcode bringing this hardware to life and defining our instruction set. But that's for a next video. Take care. Bye.